I'd like to begin with a story, and it happens to be true. A young physician starts a job on a maternity ward in a famous European hospital. He watches young women who were previously healthy dying of overwhelming infection shortly after childbirth. He's appalled at the high death rates, which peak at 15% in one year. He investigates the problem, comes up with a simple solution, implements it on a small scale, and sees a dramatic decrease in infection and mortality. He tries to spread his simple solution elsewhere. But for the most part, he's ignored, ridiculed, and rejected. He finds himself out of a job. He goes to a different hospital in a different European city, confirms his findings, tries to spread them, and again is ignored and rejected. He ends up dying at the age of 47 in an insane asylum. Thus ended the life of Ignaz Semmelweis, the famous Hungarian obstetrician who is known as the father of hand hygiene. Semmelweis noted that when medical doctors who were coming from performing autopsies washed their hands with antiseptic solution before delivering babies, the rates of infection in mothers and their death rate decreased by 90%. Incredible. Consistently implementing evidence-based practices like hand washing, however, remains a challenge even today. This despite the fact that hand washing is considered the most important way of preventing lethal hospital infections. Hospital infections affect about two million Americans every year, 100,000 of whom die. Importantly, 70% of these infections could be prevented if evidence-based recommendations were used. So while on the one hand, we have an explosion in biomedical research with novel diagnostic tests like functional MRI, life-saving new drugs, and robotic surgeries that are very high-tech. What I'm going to talk about is decidedly low-tech, something that we all learned the importance of in preschool and that's washing our hands. We know that hand washing prevents infection, and we have known this for a century and a half. My focus will be on what is preventing the widespread implementation of this and other practices that prevent hospital infection. Studies have revealed that Americans and you receive recommended care about half the time. Even 150 years after Semmelweis, however, another study reported that just 40% of healthcare workers comply with hand hygiene practices. The rates are higher in nurses than they are in doctors, and they are higher after touching the patient rather than before, likely related to self-protection. So despite knowing the importance of hand washing for a long time, why are doctors and nurses not washing their hands? Or put another way, how can we change people's behavior so that the right thing is done each and every time a patient is admitted to the hospital? 
our research has shown that there are several barriers to change. One major hurdle is that healthcare workers often don't like to change behavior. And in fact, we call these individuals the active resistors. They like doing things the way they've always been done. Why? It's always been done that way. <laughs> and while there are some nurses in this category, I have to say this is the purview of doctors. At least the good news is, is you know who these individuals are so you can engage them in a conversation because they'll raise their hand, say, I disagree. I don't believe the data or that's not a problem in our hospital. The second group of individuals that serve as a barrier are people that are much more difficult to figure out who they are. We call these individuals the organizational constipators. <laughs> they say the right things at meetings. They nod their head in agreement. You think they're on board with change, but when it's time to act, they're missing in action. And the challenging thing about organizational constipators is that the people above them think they're doing a good job, while the people below them can't believe they still have a job. <laughs> and while we know active resistors and organizational constipators exist in hospitals because we've seen them in action, I suspect you see them in other areas as well, higher education, private industry, as well as government. More broadly, however, there's another barrier to change, and that's a culture of mediocrity that exists in the hospital rather than a culture of excellence. So what's a culture of mediocrity? The hospital is happy to be average. As long as their infection rates aren't too high, they're okay. Organizational constipators are prevalent. Leadership is considered ineffective. And overperformers, and overperformers do exist in these hospitals, are rewarded. Their reward? More work. They have to do their job, plus the job that the underperformers are not doing because they're not being held accountable by ineffective leaders. Raise your hand if you currently or ever have worked in an organization that has a culture of mediocrity. Wow. Yeah, about 60%. There's someone over there with two hands up. <laughs> Sometimes it can be difficult to detect underperformers. But because a picture is worth a thousand words, let me show you what a real-life underperformer looks like. <laughs> so this is my son, Sean. <laughs> he will be graduating from the University of Michigan in 29 days. <laughs> but shown here, he learned how to do something that he perfected while in middle school, and that is, and that is how to kick back and enjoy the ride. Right? <laughs> so how do we overcome these problems? There are many approaches, but what I'd like to focus on is changing the culture through conformity and social learning. Conformity and social learning are universal. I'm a member of many different groups, many different cultures, and each has elements of conformity in social learning. First, some definitions. Conformity just means that you behave in a way that the people around you are behaving. And even though it has somewhat of a negative connotation, I think conformity can be very powerful in changing behavior. I'll show you how in a moment. Social learning occurs when the group's behavior becomes internalized by the individual and it becomes their own behavior. And in fact, 
This cultural transmission of behavior can be thought of as a second inheritance system. Behavior is transmitted from person to person, but not through the genes or DNA, but through culture. Let me share with you an example from the animal kingdom, specifically related to monkeys. In this study of 109 wild vervet monkeys, the investigators did the following. You should know that monkeys like corn. So they, called, they took one color of corn, which was pink, and it was treated to taste bitter in two of the four groups. The other color, blue, was left untreated and naturally tasty. In the other two groups, it was just reversed. After six months, the researchers returned and provided the two colors of corn to the various groups again. This time, all the corn was tasty. The focus was on infant monkeys and immigrant monkeys. And this is what they found. The preference for the tasty <laughs> color was retained even when both colors were untreated and tasted exactly the same. Infants never exposed to the bitter corn preferred the same color corn as their mothers, and most interestingly, males who migrated from a group where one color was preferred abandoned their previous preference and adopted the preference of the new group. The monkeys acquired this new behavior through social learning. Another way to think about it, monkey see, monkey do. <laughs> the idea, though, of social learning is something that happens every day and not just in experiments. Let me give you another example from the human kingdom, specifically my wife and her shopping habits. <laughs> so in Ann Arbor, when we go grocery shopping, we shop usually at one, one or two stores. The first is Kroger, and the second is Whole Foods. So Kroger, large discounted chain, relatively inexpensive, with no explicit focus on the environment. Whole Foods, on the other hand, is an upscale chain, euphemistic for expensive. Right? Some people jokingly refer to it as whole paycheck. Right? <laughs> With an explicit focus on the environment. And what I find really interesting is when Veronica goes in to Kroger, she thinks nothing of loading up the groceries into the environmentally unfriendly plastic bags. But every single time she goes into Whole Foods, it can be on the same day as the day we went to Kroger. She brings her reusable bags. <laughs> same person, same day, acting differently. So what's going on here? I think it has to do with culture. Not her culture, but the culture of the stores, which are very different. When I've asked her why she does this, she said, well, if I don't bring my own bags into Whole Foods, I get dirty looks, and it makes me self-conscious. From who? Cashiers, the baggers, the other customers. So how can we use this idea of social learning to improve healthcare? I believe we need to create a culture so that we refuse to accept anything but the highest standard of care. So that the only acceptable approach in a hospital or in a healthcare system is to treat a patient the way you would want your family member to be treated. So that when a surgeon overlooks hand washing before she examines a wound, or a nurse forgets to wash his hands before inserting the IV catheter, the people around them give them dirty looks 
and make them feel self-conscious. That will change behavior. So we've talked a lot about creating a culture of excellence, but how is that reinforced and how is that maintained? Leadership is crucial. Since the culture of any organization is shaped by the worst behavior a leader tolerates. If we let organizational constipators run rampant, we shouldn't be surprised if the hospital gets even more backed up. Right? <laughs> and leadership, I realize, is a top-down approach to behavioral change. I'd like to now transition into a more bottom-up approach, a more personal solution. Because grassroots changes usually happen when it becomes personal, when we make decisions several times a day to behave differently. More specifically, I'd like to talk about mindfulness. Mindfulness has emerged as a popular concept, but can it improve healthcare? Specifically, can it help doctors and nurses remember to wash their hands before touching a patient? Perhaps. Mindfulness was introduced by Buddha 2,500 years ago when he said that all things are preceded by the mind. The concept was popularized in the United States by John Kabat-Zinn in the 1990s, who taught that mindfulness is the awareness that arises by paying attention on purpose in the present moment, non-judgmentally. And the thing about mindfulness, fortunately, is that it can be done all the time, several times during a day, like in the middle of a midterm examination on cognitive psychology, or during a talk in front of 1,300 of your new best friends, or when washing one's hands before placing those very same hands onto a vulnerable patient. Importantly, however, when we talk about mindfulness in healthcare, what we really are talking about is heartfulness, which is a state of being in which kindness and compassion and connectedness to others helps guide one's life. So how then do we kind of apply heartfulness to a busy hospital environment? For guidance, I turn to Dr. Avidis Donabedian. Dr. Donabedian is known as the international leader in healthcare quality. And he was a longtime faculty member here at the University of Michigan. He, in fact, died in Ann Arbor of widespread cancer at the age of 81. And shortly before he died, he was interviewed. And he was asked, how do you improve healthcare quality? And Dr. Don Abedian said, the secret to high quality care is love. Love for your patient, love for your colleagues, love for your hospital. Because if you have love, you will work backwards to improve the system. And if we had love, we will wash our hands before touching our patient. Hands, after all, are meant to heal. Thank you very much. <laughs>